you have your Bible with you, let me encourage you to hold it up and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth. For what we believe and how we live. Now turn with me to two passages of scripture in your copy of God's word. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Then hold your place there and turn with me to James chapter 2. So Acts 8, James 2. Both of those are New Testament books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And then James is more toward the end of the New Testament. So Acts 8. James 2. Years ago, my wife and daughter flew to New York for a mother-daughter trip. And they shopped, and they shopped some more, and then they shopped some more. And on one of their excursions, they bought me a Rolex watch. And if you know anything about Rolex watches, you know that they are expensive. But not this Rolex watch. She bought this Rolex watch watch down an alley in a back room for about twenty dollars now was it because she was a great negotiator no was it because she knew how to will and deal no that's not it either it's because the Rolex that she bought me was a fake it was a knockoff it was a cheap imitation of the real thing it looked like a Rolex it told time like a Rolex, but it wasn't a Rolex. It was a fake. And I'm afraid that that's how it is with many people who claim to be disciples, followers of Jesus today when it comes to our faith. I'm afraid that we have a cheap imitation of the real thing. Now let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Back in 2011, there was a Gallup poll that came out that said that over 90% of Americans believed in God. Think about that for just a moment. 2011, just a little over 10 years ago, 13 years ago, 90% plus of Americans said they believed in God. In 2022, that number had dropped to 81%. Now, that's a big drop, but still, 81% of Americans say we believe in God. But let's take that a little bit further. A Rasmussen survey that was taken in 2021 discovered that 72% of adult Americans say that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of man, and they believe that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. 72% of adult Americans say, we believe Jesus is who he said. We believe he died for our sins. We believe he rose from the grave. But my question is, if that's the case, if 72% of us adults really do believe that, then how in the world are we in the shape that we are in as a nation today? I believe the problem is, our faith, our faith isn't real. Our faith is a cheap imitation of the real thing. Now, and if your Bible is open to Acts chapter 8, I want to give you a little bit of background before I read some of this passage of Scripture. In Acts, 8 chapter, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we're told that a great persecution had arisen in the church. The church was being persecuted and because of this Christians were being scattered all over the region of Judah and Samaria and one of the Christians that was scattered because of this persecution was Philip Philip was one of the very first deacons in the church in Jerusalem and he was a man of God and Philip ended up in the city of Samaria and as Philip had a custom of doing wherever he went he told people about Jesus, and he did that in Samaria. And when he began to tell people about Jesus, Jesus changed people's lives, and people got saved. I want you to listen to what it says 
beginning in verse 9. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. So as we continue to read, we, we discover that the church in Jerusalem heard about what was taking place in Samaria. And so they sent Peter and John there to, to get a look at what was going on. And when they got there, they discovered that these people had indeed received Jesus, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. And so they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And then listen to what it says beginning in verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he explained, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this. Your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness. And pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Now here was Simon. He believed. He was baptized. He began following Philip. He was amazed at the power of God. And yet when he offered Peter money for the power of So that when he laid his hands on people, they would receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said, your money is going to be destroyed with you because your heart is not right with God. You are held captive by sin. You see, Simon wasn't saved. He was lost. He believed. He was baptized. He was amazed at the power of God, but yet he was held captive by wickedness. He had never actually been changed. You see, not everyone who believes in Jesus, not everyone who has faith in Jesus is saved. All faith is not saving faith. And that's what James talks about in James chapter 2. Now let me give you a little bit of background. James who wrote the book of James was the half brother of Jesus. And none of Jesus' brothers and sisters believed in Jesus until after Jesus died and was resurrected. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 that after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he appeared to James, his half brother, and James became a believer. Evidently after that appearance, he went to the believers in Jerusalem and began to meet with them and he eventually became a leader in the church in Jerusalem. He was there when the apostle Paul came to Jerusalem to meet with Peter after his his conversion to Christianity. And James was still there leading the church 14 years later when they had the council of Jerusalem where, where they were deciding what the Gentile believers needed to do to become a part of the church. And this book, this epistle that that James wrote was a very practical book. It, It was a book that told the believers how to put their faith into practice in their life. But in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, James takes this deep dive into what faith really is. And I want you to listen to what he says beginning in verse 14. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, 
but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Now, in these verses, James makes it clear that not all faith is saving faith. And James speaks about three kinds of faith, and only one is a saving faith. Now, James begins by talking about dead faith. I want you to listen to what he says again in verse 17. He says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead. And it's useless. Now, did you get that? James says that unless our faith produces good deeds, it's dead. It's good for nothing except to be buried under the ground. Have you ever gone to a funeral or a visitation where they have the casket open so you can see the person one last time before they're buried and you can pay your final respects to them, I guess? And if you've ever been to many visitations or funerals like that, you'll occasionally hear someone say, don't they look good? They look so natural. Now, the reality is that morticians can do an incredible job. And they can make a person look good in that casket. They can make a person look natural in that casket. But the reality is they're still dead. It doesn't matter how they look. It doesn't matter how natural they look. They're dead. And James says that faith that doesn't produce is dead. And in the three verses before verse 17, he gives us two reasons why that faith is dead. He begins by telling us that faith is more than just a verbal confession. Listen to what he says in verse 14. He says, what good is it, your brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Now, the key word there is that word say, underline it. James doesn't say if a person has faith. He says if a person says they have faith. The question we need to ask is, does a verbal claim of faith save a person? Just because I've said something does that make it true? As I said earlier, there was a, a survey done in 2021 that said 187 million adults in the United States say they believe Jesus is the Son of God. They believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. They believe Jesus was resurrected from the grave. But if 187 million of us adults had saving faith, I don't believe that our country would be in the shape we're in today. You see, we have a lot of confession of faith, but we don't have a lot of practice of faith. And we need to understand that talk is cheap. Do you remember what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because I say something doesn't make it true. I mean, I can say that I'm a surgeon, 
But I'm telling you right now, you don't want me to perform open heart surgery on you. I can say that I'm a mechanic, but that doesn't mean I know how to overhaul an engine. I can say I've got a, a sure win investment for your money, but that doesn't mean that you need to trust me with your money. And just because a person says they are a Christian doesn't mean that they're a Christian. But then James tells us another thing. He tells us that faith is more than an emotional feeling. Look what he says in verses 15 and 16. He says, suppose you see a brother or sister who has, a, has no food or clothing. And you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Now, in these verses, James moves to an illustration. And he tells us about people who are without two of the necessities of life, food and clothes. And the way he describes these people, they aren't professional beggars. These aren't con artists. You know, the kind of people that we see oftentimes and we know they're scammers. No, these are fellow Christians who have a desperate need. And when we see them, our heart goes out to them. We're emotionally moved. We may even have some tears in our eyes and we say things like, I'm praying for you. I hope you can find some way to stay warm. I hope you can find some food to eat. But what good is that? I mean, if I'm stirred to tears because I see a need and I have the ability to meet that need and I don't, then I haven't really helped. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? In that story Jesus tells, there's a man who was beaten and robbed and left for dead. And two religious men walk by and they see him. They see the need, but they walk on by. I'm sure that their heart went out for this man, but they had somewhere to go. They had a place to be. But then the Samaritan came by. He stopped. He bandaged the man's wounds. He put him on his donkey. He took him to an inn. He told that innkeeper, you take care of him until he gets back to hell. Whatever it costs, I'll pay you for it. You see, if my faith doesn't lead me to share with others, if I have an ability to do so, then something is wrong with my faith. James says what's wrong with it is it's dead. It's useless. You see, a corpse can look natural. A corpse can look good but if if it's a corpse it's dead I want you to listen to what Jesus said in John 3 verse 17 he said if someone has enough money to live well and, and sees a brother or sisters in need but shows no compassion how can God's love be in that person 1 John 3 17 I don't know about you but man that verse kind of stings me at times does it you? Because there's been times in my life where I've seen people with a need and I've had the ability to step in and meet that need. And I didn't. And John says that if we do that, God's love really isn't in us. James would say our faith may be a confession with our mouth. It may be an emotion that we feel in our heart, but it's dead. James would say, show me your faith. Verse 18, he says, now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. James is saying, if our faith is not seen, if it's not proven if it's not evidenced by our behavior it's not faith at all real faith will be seen in our lives the apostle paul said this in second corinthians he said if anyone is in christ they are a new creation the old has died we've become brand new when we place our faith in christ a transformation takes place. The power of the living God comes to live in us. Here's what I know. 
If I take hold of a 220 volt line, I'm going to know it. Because there's power in that line. And if the God of all creation comes to live in our lives, we're going to know it. It's going to make a change in our life. So there's dead faith. And then James tells us that there is demonic faith. Listen to what he says in verse 19. He says, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. James wanted the church to know that simply believing the right thing, having intellectual belief, doesn't save. He even goes so far as to say that the devils believe and tremble in fear. Have you ever stopped to consider that Satan and the demons that rebelled against God with him believe in him? They believe that God created them. They they know it's a fact. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They knew Jesus before he was born on this earth. They believe Jesus died on the cross. Their leader tried to kill him. They believe that he was resurrected from the grave. The demons believe everything that Orthodox Christians believe about Jesus. And they tremble in fear at his name. But they're not saved. Suppose we have a demon that comes to our church and wants to join our church. As you can imagine, I'm a little skeptical, I'm a little suspicious. And so I want to meet with this demon to ask him some questions. So I set up an appointment, have him in my office, and I sit down with him. I say, Mr. D, I don't want to call him a demon. Say, Mr. D, do you believe that the Bible is the perfect word of God? He said, oh, yes, I believe that. Okay, good. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of all mankind? Without a doubt, I believe that. Say, Mr. D. Are you willing to turn from your sin and trust Jesus to be your Savior and follow him all the days of your life? Oh, no, I'm not doing that. I don't want to trust Jesus. I don't want to follow Jesus. You see, just because I believe something is true doesn't mean that I'm saved. Faith is more than intellectual belief. A faith that saves produces results. There are a lot of Bible-believing people that are going to go to hell. There are a lot of people that believe Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave for their sins that are going to end up in hell. People are going to miss heaven by 12 inches. The distance from the head to the heart. We have a head knowledge. But our heart has never been changed. I believe that's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 10 that we must believe with our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. So there's dead faith, there's demonic faith, and then there's saving faith. I want you to listen to what James said in verse 20. He began by saying, fool, when will you ever learn that believing is useless without doing? Faith that does not result in good deeds is not real faith. And then then in the next several verses, James gives us two examples. And the two people he uses as examples are as different as night and day. One is a man, one is a woman. One's a Jew, one's a Gentile. One was a patriarch of the faith, one was a prostitute. One was considered a somebody, the the father of all of Israel. The other was considered by many a nobody, an unknown person. But you see, it doesn't matter who you are, it's what you do, because faith is doing. I want us to look at these two examples. First is is Abraham. If your Bible is open in James chapter 2, verse 21 is referring to Genesis 22, when in obedience Abraham willingly offered up his son Isaac, his only son, as a sacrifice to God. Now, was that what saved him? No. It's not what saved him. He was saved 30 years earlier when in Genesis 15 says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What he did 
in Genesis 21, 22, verified his faith. His works were an expression of his faith. You see, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Let me say that again. We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Now look at Rahab. This story took place when the spies went into Jericho to scope out that city, and Rahab risked her life to help protect those spies. But understand, she wasn't saved because of what she did. She was saved earlier when Joshua chapter 2 verse 11 makes it clear that she expressed her faith that the God of Israel was the one true God. Now look at verses 24 and 25. Twice in those verses you see that word justified or in the New Living Translation it says shown to be right. The Greek word that is used in both those instances is, a, is in a present passive indicative. Now that tense means that the act that was performed was not what was making them right with God. But the act that was performed was showing they were right with God. You see, what they did wasn't what saved them. What they did proved that they had been saved in the first place. You see, our faith is not determined by what we do. But our faith is demonstrated by what we do. Let me say that again. Our faith is not determined by what we do, but our faith is demonstrated by what we do. So let me ask you a question. Has your faith demonstrated that you have a real, genuine relationship with Jesus? Have you trusted Jesus with your life? Have you surrendered your life to him? Back in the 1900s, there was a famous French tightrope walker. His name was Charles Blondin. And what made Charles Blondin so famous was his walks across the Niagara Gorge. Now, the Niagara Gorge is 1,100 feet across. And he put this tightrope across that gorge that is above the Niagara Falls. And he would walk across that tightrope. But he would not only walk across that tightrope, he would push a wheelbarrow across that tightrope. He would be blindfolded and he would walk across that tightrope. He would get on stilts, and he would walk across that tightrope, 1,100 feet above the Niagara Falls. And in one particular show, after he had walked across and did one of his feats, the people were shouting, Blondin, 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 Blondin. Blondin silenced the crowd. And he said, how many of you believe? that I can put a person on my shoulders and walk across this tightrope. And the people with one voice begin to shout, we believe, we believe, we believe. And then Blondin silenced them. And he asked, who will be the one who gets on my shoulders? No one stepped forward. Until his manager finally came got on his shoulders, and Blondin walked across. You see, I'm afraid that, that many of us have faith like the people who are in that audience that day. We say we believe, we say we trust, but when it comes down to it, we're not willing to get on Jesus and let him guide and direct our life. And that's what saving faith is. It's not just a confession with our mouth. It's not just an emotional feeling with our heart. It's not just an intellectual belief with our head. Faith is a trust that is so powerful that it causes us to trust our very lives to the one we're trusting. 
And that's what the disciples, the first followers of Jesus did. They left everything and began to follow Jesus. And when Jesus died, Jesus was resurrected. They began to proclaim a message that led every single one of them to their death. But they never stopped because they had faith. They believed. They really trusted Jesus with their lives. Do you? Do you have that kind of faith? The kind of faith that transforms you and causes you to live your life different than the people of this world. Because that's what Jesus calls us to as disciples, followers of him. I want you to bow your head. I want you to close your eyes. With your head bowed and with your eyes closed, I just want you to take a moment and, and look at your faith. Just be honest. Just be honest. You have no reason to lie to yourself. Ask yourself, does the faith I profess is it the kind of faith that James says saves in James chapter 2? And if your faith isn't the kind of faith that saves, then what are you going to do about it? Are you going to leave this room continuing to play a game? Or are you going to humble yourself and finally step out in faith and trust Jesus with your life regardless of where it leads, regardless of what it takes? When I was growing up, we would sing a song in church here at the end of the service. Oftentimes the song said, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus to trust and obey. And I'm asking you today to trust Jesus with a trust that is so powerful it will cause you to obey him whatever he asks you to do. If you haven't done that, do it today. In just a moment as we stand and we begin to sing, don't wait on anyone else. You come and you say, I won't trust Jesus that way. Let Jesus save you. Father God, this is your time. And all we ask is that you'll have your way in each of every one of our lives. Lord, help us to be disciples who have not dead faith, certainly not demonic faith, but a saving, transforming faith. Faith that is willing to follow you to the ends of the earth. Work in our lives today, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Stand with me.